So um, the last part of this uh, this first hour, I'm going to spend talking about uh, the Marshall Trilogy. And these uh, are the three um, foundational Indian law cases um, that if you're interested in this area, um, you have to, to read those cases, understand those cases. Uh, maybe one or two of them you, you read back in law school already. Um, but if you're interested in this topic, um, you should revisit these cases and, and uh, really try to understand what's going on with them. Uh, so they're uh, Johnson versus McIntosh, Cherokee versus Georgia, and Wooster v. Georgia. So first, Johnson versus McIntosh. This was decided in 1823, and it was the first Indian law case decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. And Johnson v. McIntosh was a land dispute in the nature of ejectment involving non-Indians. So it was an Indian law case, but there weren't even uh, any Indians involved in the case. One party in the case had acquired title, uh, purportedly acquired title, uh, from a tribe through a private purchase. And the other party, uh, on the other side of the V, uh, had purportedly acquired title uh, with, a, uh, with a government land patent. And it's uh, pretty well established um, at this point that uh, Johnson versus McIntosh was collusive litigation, um, that these were uh, land speculators that were seeking to uh, defeat um, the, the, the 1763 uh, Royal Pro Proclamation that I talked about before, uh, saying that only the, the government, at that time the Crown, uh, could acquire uh, title from Indian tribes. So they were seeking to, to defeat this through the coerce, uh, collusive litigation, and, um, and the case was decided on a set of stipulated facts. Um, and uh, there's quite a bit written out there uh, about this that uh, says that these facts uh, were actually incorrect. Uh, if you want to read more about this, um, I would highly recommend uh, Lindsay Robertson's book, uh, Conquest by Law, that uh, really goes in uh, to the discovery doctrine and, and the details of this particular case. But it was uh, Johnson versus McIntosh was important because uh, it was the first articulation of the discovery doctrine uh, by uh, the United States courts. And it says that uh, governing colonial powers uh, acquired to, uh, title to land and that the tribes uh, retained an aboriginal title or a title of occupancy. And when the U.S. succeeded Great Britain's preemptive rights to acquire the underlying uh, or the uh, uh, that that uh, title of occupancy, um, then uh, that could only be alienated through a sale to the United States. So, uh, again, continuing this idea that um, uh, that the acquisition of Indian lands was a, a governmental matter, not a matter for individual land speculators. And that now uh, that that uh, preemptive right to acquire Indian lands was vested in the United States. So the uh, the next case that was uh, decided uh, was Cherokee versus Georgia, and that came in 1831. And as I talked a little bit about before, uh, when we talked about the Indian removal policy, uh, that period of time. Uh, was just an extraordinarily uh, tense time and a time filled with conflicts, especially in the southeastern United States, between settlers and Indian tribes. And uh, Georgia had uh, uh, made this agreement with the United States that it would cede some of its western lands to the U.S. for new states. In exchange, uh, the United States would negotiate um, removal of the tribes from Georgia uh, onto uh, lands west of the Mississippi. But as I mentioned, these negotiations uh, weren't going very quickly um, and not going very well. And Georgia was, was quite unhappy with this. And um, what it did was it uh, decided to take things into their own hands and uh, passed a state law 
that declared the Cherokee Territory to be Cherokee County in Georgia. And it opened uh, all those lands, all those Cherokee lands, to non-Indian settlement. And the Georgia legislature also purported to extend its state jurisdiction into those Indian lands. And it declared all tribal laws to be null and void. And just to make sure that um, none of the Cherokees could uh, challenge this, it prohibited uh, Indians from testifying in court. So the Cherokee Nation sued Georgia in the Supreme Court, uh, relying on Article Three, Section 2, original jurisdiction of the court um, for actions by foreign nations. And so the principal holding in the case was really pretty straightforward, that Indian tribes are not foreign nations, uh, which would give uh, original jurisdiction to the court under Article 3, Section 2. Um, but the case is not really cited for, for that straightforward holding, but, but typically for two other propositions. Uh, one that, um, uh, that the court talked about tribes are nations, and that this is evidenced by the fact that Great Britain and the United States entered into treaties with these tribes. And the tribes are self-governing, um, that they make war, uh, uh, for example, uh, like any other sovereign government. But the court then went on to say that um, tribes are not states of the union, but they're domestic dependent nations. And that's uh, this phrase that you may have heard before that the court used to describe Indian tribes, domestic dependent nations, domestic dependent nations. The court held that treaties with tribes in the United States wherein the tribe, uh, the tribe agreed to come under the protection of the United States, uh, it gave up alliances, uh, the right to, to make alliances with other, other governments. So uh, those treaties divested the tribe of uh, what the court referred to as external sovereignty. But uh, at the same time, that they... Uh, retained internal sovereignty, internal governing authority. So that um, that that distinction, I think, becomes very important as we get into more modern eras of Indian law. Um, the distinction the court makes there: the tribes are sovereign, but um, they their external sovereignty is is somewhat limited because of their relationship with the United States. But their internal sovereignty, the, their power to in, uh, govern internal affairs, uh, remains very broad, and and that um, uh, becomes very important, I think, later on uh, when the courts look to insight to this case. Um, so the although Cherokee versus Georgia articulated very important law uh, principles of Indian law that courts still cite to today. Um, it didn't resolve uh, the dispute between the Cherokee Nation and the state of Georgia because the court ultimately concluded that it didn't have jurisdiction. So there was still this dispute out there. So then the next year, uh, the ca uh, uh, another case came before the court, Wooster versus Georgia. And uh, Samuel Wooster was a missionary that lived uh, in the Cherokee Nation and uh, the Cherokees were fine with uh, uh, Samuel Wooster being there and, and doing his work in the Cherokee Territory. Um, but Georgia convicted uh, Mr. Wooster of violating a state law that uh, prohibited non-Indians from being in Indian country without a license. And um, to give you some idea of just how uh, high the tensions were at this point uh, between Georgia and the United States over these issues, Georgia didn't even file a brief in the case. So if you can imagine a case coming before the United States Supreme Court today where one party just doesn't even file a brief um, and doesn't show up for oral argument, um, and that's what Georgia did in this case. Um, and the opinion ultimately uh, included very strong language that analogized tribes to foreign powers. 
So uh, you can see Justice Marshall um, sort of walking back a little bit from uh, his uh, language in uh, Johnson v. McIntosh. But analogizing tribes to sovereign powers, and it made absolutely clear in this opinion that Georgia laws had no application in Indian country uh, in the Cherokee Territory. And it emphasized the, um, the tribe's plenary authority uh, within its own uh, territory. And it said that uh, because of the supremacy clause of, of the U.S. Constitution, uh, Georgia's laws had no force at all in Indian country. Um, and Wooster versus uh, Georgia and these, these principles of uh, uh, limited state power in Indian country uh, still hold true today. There's still a presumption that in Indian country um, state laws don't have any force and effect. Um, but some of the subsequent uh, uh, cases from the court have, have modified this rule somewhat. Um, and uh, we're going to get into that in, uh, in a few minutes after we take a break. Uh, 